I am Brad Keeler. He is Matt Evans. Find out next on Director's Cut how Matt learned valuable life lessons from an Italian restaurant in Virginia Beach. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler. I am the director of the Geo Institute. That is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every week, I sit down with a different GI member who gives us perspectives on life, on their professional life, on their personal life. What do those things always have in common? They are always fun. If you like what you are about to see, and I think you will, click the button that says subscribe. Click the bell that says get notifications. I guess it doesn't say that. It will if you mouse over it. If you do that, you will be notified every single time we post a video to our YouTube channel. With that out of the way, we are very happy to be joined today by our guest from the left coast of the United States of America, from Oregon State University. It is Matt Evans. Matt, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me. We are going to have a good time today. We know the format. It's 10 questions. We start out with the same one that we ask every guest. Describe your job in 45 seconds. Sure. Uh, so right now I wear uh, I wear two hats. Um, my my first hat is my my professor hat, and I, I teach classes. I do research. I have the opportunity to mentor and, and work with grad students, and uh, provide service to the, the the profession. That's you know what I've been doing for the last. 15, 16 years now. Um, more recently, just a, a few months ago, I moved into a role as the associate dean for faculty and staff advancement in the College of Engineering. And uh, what I do in that role is I, I help my colleagues with uh, uh, professional development, uh, navigating the, the promotion and tenure process. Uh, I work on fostering and facilitating a diverse and inclusive community in the College of Engineering, uh, not just with faculty, but but staff also. And uh, I also oversee our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives for the college. That is excellent. We will ask you a little bit more about those hats later on in the program. First, we must find out some key information about other aspects of your life. We will delve right into the fun questions. The first one being, what would you say is your greatest fear in life? Well, you know, I live in this constant state of feeling like I'm forgetting something, and and usually I am. And and my, my greatest fear is that it's going to be something really important one day. Um, but, but I think that... Uh, uh, more than that, I often worry about, I work a lot and, and I often worry that I, I worry if I've done right by my kids or if I'm doing right by my kids, that that's a big fear for me is that, you know, I want my kids to understand the, 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 the value of hard work, how important it is to love your job, um, how important it is to, 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 to do a job that's, that's, um, in some way, I hope helpful to society, um, but but I hope that that I don't impart those les lessons at the 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 expense of, yeah. of spending enough time with them. Right, um, that that's always the biggest fear. Has the fear of forgetting been with you for a long time? I, I think it was worse for me when I was still in school. Like there was always this black cloud that something was going to hit me unexpectedly. You know, it's actually been worse for me since I've been a, a professor than wh when I was in school. Um, you know, when I was in school, there was always this sense that uh, uh, you could recover from something. You know, you fail a test while well, pass the next one. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, now in, in the, the you know, in, in, in my position now, I feel like I could drop something or forget something. And it could actually be of consequence. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. I, and I guess that's good. You had a lot more perspective than I did. I think I, I was more doom and gloom. <laughs> so thinking back to all of your academic degrees or that time after high school, you had breaks in between each one of your degrees, in between bachelor's, master's, and PhD. How do you feel that that shaped your education? Did it change anything you did each step of the way? 
Yeah, oh, absolutely it did. And and the breaks were different, you know. Um, I, I, I got a degree in physics. Um, I, I graduated. I realized that I wasn't very good at it um, or, or really that, that I wasn't very dedicated to it. Um, I couldn't find a job using my degree. Um, I ended up uh, finding a job cooking in a restaurant. Um, I cooked for a couple of years. Um, I met the woman that eventually became my wife. Um, and uh, uh, I, I kind of had time to think about, you know, my, my first time in school, the goal was just getting a degree and graduating. There wasn't really much thought about what came after that. And and so I spent a couple of years after that thinking about, you know, what did I really want to do? Um, you know, I met Michelle. We were starting to get kind of serious. I was thinking, well, maybe I should kind of start to take my life a bit more seriously. And so when I went back to school to, to UNM as a, a an undergraduate major in civil engineering, I, I took it a lot more seriously. And, and, you know, going to school then for those two years was, it was my job. You know, I'd get to campus at eight o'clock in the morning. I'd work until, you know, three, four, five o'clock in the afternoon. I'd go home and, and, uh, took it way more seriously than I did the first time around. Um, I knew very much what I wanted to do when I finished that degree was I wanted to go get a job. I wanted to practice engineering. Um, I was tired of being poor. I had been a college student for a really long time at that point. Um, and, uh, uh, I went into practice and, and I had this, uh, I had a great experience in private practice. I worked for, uh, uh, for Geosyntec and, uh, in Huntington beach. I worked for a lot of great engineers. Um, Ed Cavazangian was my boss. Um, and, uh, I, I learned a, a tremendous amount, but, um, what I missed was research. Um, you know, I learned about practicing engineering. I, I learned about what, what geotechnical engineers do on a day-to-day a, a -day basis. You know, our responsibility to society, uh, our, our, you know, our role in large civil infrastructure projects. Um, but I missed the research that I had done while I was at University of New Mexico. I worked in uh, uh, John Stormont's lab looking at uh, unsaturated flow in soils and, and geotextiles. And I, and I missed that sort of sense of discovery and open-ended problems. And uh, the, the more I kind of thought about it, the more I kind of thought that the, the only way the, the only path back to that as a career was through graduate school. And um, so I kind of uh, uh, packed up with what I had learned as a practicing engineer, headed off to graduate school with this sort of uh, renewed sense of wonder about, about research and this, uh, uh, you know, renewed enthusiasm for discovery. And so I think that sort of at, at, you know, at any one of these, these, these junctures, um, things could have gone wildly different, but they didn't. That is great. And I think every time I hear an answer like that, I think about my experience too. I was one of the people who went straight through. I ended up quitting my PhD, but that's a different story. <laughs> but I'm 21 in this master's program and I see people who are, to, to me at that point, ancient, you know, 29 or 30, taking it so seriously to be there. And I think it helped me a lot. So I I bet you were a great role model for a lot of students a little younger than you, and you might not have even realized you were that good of a role model, <laughs> but it makes a big impact. So now, thinking about your research, um, it has applications in a lot of fields outside civil engineering, and maybe you want to give a little, quick little uh, summary of what you're working on. What's the most unexpected collaboration you've had because of that wide-ranging application? Sure. So um, much of what I've done for most of my career is granular mechanics and, you know, trying to understand the way that uh, – uh, or if we understand how individual particles interact with one another, can we scale that up to understand how masses of particles behave at the engineering scale? So as a, a you know, a trained geotechnical engineer for me, that, that usually means sands or gravels, but it can mean anything from, from dirt to, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals or powders or agricultural grains or anything like that. And, um, the, the only time I think that, that research has actually just fallen into my lap was one time several years ago. I'm sitting in my office. My phone rings, and uh, I pick it up, and, and the fellow on the other end says, well, um, I work for, for you know, the, the, this company a couple of towns over, and we do 3D printing. And, or not, I'm sorry, not 3D printing. We do additive manufacturing. So, so effectively 3D printing yeah. with metal powders, right? He says, and, and we're having some some problem. Uh, 
deciding how well these powders are going to spread based on, you know, we do these characterization tests to try to tell us how, how well we're going to be able to, to spread them prior to, to, to laser centering. Uh, is that something you do? And I thought about it for a second and I said, well, it is now. <laughs> and uh, that, that's something that, that we've now been working on for uh, uh, almost four years with them is, is trying to better understand how we can predict the, uh, uh, the workability of these, these metal powders. And, um, you know, what's so much different about them than, say, sands is how small they are, you know, mm -hmm. particles that are on the order of tens of microns. And so they have some, uh, uh, some similarities with, say, clays. Um, but they're different because they don't have the same types of surface charges as clays. So that they really are still granular materials. So as you're describing that, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, this sounds like the type of civil engineering work that somebody with a physics background would do. Do you, do you think that that still impacts the work that you do now? I, I think it very much impacts the way that I go about problem solving. Um, and, and that, uh, you know, one of the things that I found to be very different, particularly at the undergraduate level, between the physics degree and the engineering degree, was the way that we approach problems. Um, in uh, uh, in the, the the physics program, problems were kind of very open ended. It was about learning the process to solve problems, and then putting these things together and uh, uh, solving a problem that you might not have have seen before, um, and and that's really a lot what a lot of what research is like um, you you work on building a toolbox you know you um, you know you work on having a you know a hammer and a screwdriver and a saw and and, and whatever you might need um, and then you can in theory if you know how to use those tools you can build whatever you want um, I think sometimes with engineering at the undergraduate level we tend to focus on teaching a student how to build a table and we're going to build this table, and then we're going to build a table that's a little bit different, and then we're going to build a table that's a little bit different. And then for your homework problem, you're going to build a table that's a little bit different from that. And then you ask them to build a chair, and that's a really hard thing to do. And and so I think that uh, uh, that 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 initial learning with the, the physics degree um, has certainly helped me be a better researcher, even if I can't say that, well, I use Schrodinger's equation every day, yeah. because I, I certainly don't. <laughs> Nor that could is, I. That is fantastic. I like that. So you, you've mentioned it already, and we'll get into it again here in a few minutes. You are from the East Coast, Virginia Beach, I, I believe. If anybody spent any significant time in the southeastern United States, you know that April and May are pretty nice, and October and November are pretty nice. Uh, what time of year do you miss the East Coast the most, and is it just the weather? So, you know, I, I, I miss the East coast the most and the least in the summer. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, uh, you know, yeah, it's so hot and humid. And, and as long as I lived there, you know, growing up in Virginia beach, um, going to school at UVA, going to school at Georgia tech, working at NC state, I spent a big part of my life on the East coast. I never got accustomed to the heat and humidity. Um, and so, so that part I don't like, but, um, I really miss summers you know spending vacations on the summer on uh hatteras island on the, the 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 outer banks of north carolina with uh with my wife and kids um it's just really one of my favorite places on the planet um it's you know it's just it's beautiful and you know there's fishing and clamming and swimming in the ocean and and you know all these sort of kind of prototypical beach things and um it, it's just beautiful there and the oregon coast don't get me wrong is absolutely beautiful it's just a it's a stark contrast right and uh uh you know in the summer if you're lucky on the oregon coast you might get a 75 degree day but the water's still so cold you can only swim for like 10 minutes <laughs> and so uh, i i miss that sort of prototypical beach experience that you can get on the east coast that's a bit harder to find in oregon it surprises me to hear you say you never got used to the heat. That uh, No. Because <laughs> I feel like I'm not even, I guess I am now, but I'm not even really a native to this area. And now, I don't know, I kind of embrace it. I, we, Anytime we've gone to Manila, <laughs> we've been there in the summer. And I always enjoy when it's hotter at my house than it is <laughs> in Manila and, and how everybody's always shocked by that. It's, it's a good way to show off. <laughs> 
I, I cursed the heat and humidity every summer until the one I left. <laughs> So the, the other question that we ask everybody on this show is how did you first get involved with ASCE and the GEO Institute? Sure. Um, you know, as, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate student, I was a student member of ASCE. I wasn't really active. Um, I continued to be a professional member after I graduated, but again, not really active. You know, I would attend geotechnical talks up at the, you know, at the LA section or, or, you know, things like that from time to time. Um, and, and then the same in graduate school, I, I kind of, you know, flirted around the edges of it. Um, I, started to engage a bit more after I finished my PhD and, and, and moved into my first academic position. Um, but, but when I really embraced it was back, I, I think starting about 2012 geo Congress in Oakland, um, I was a member of the soil properties and modeling committee. I'd been a member for about six years. And, uh, I think that, that Jason DeYoung was chair and, uh, Chris Baxter was vice chair and, uh, the, the, the succession in that committee at the time would be that the vice chair moves into the chair role. And it was time for, for Jason to shift out of the chair role. But Chris had just rotated into his department chair role at University of Rhode Island. And he said, you know, I just can't do this. And so uh, Jason approached uh, Marika Santagata and I and asked Marika to be chair and me to be vice chair. And, uh, you know, we were kind of thrown into the fire. And... Um, that was really when I engaged with with Geo Institute and ASCE in a, a, a pretty su substantive way, and um, and and as a side note, um, was the beginning of one of my most meaningful professional relationships. Uh, that with Marika, um, she's become just a a, a a fantastic friend, a fantastic colleague, and uh, I'm real lucky. Uh, real lucky that that happened the way it did because it it started this great uh this great relationship with the geo this with the geo institute and um you know something that's evolved from chair of soil properties and modeling committee to now being a member of, of tcc and um you know hopefully staying involved for the rest of my career always looking for a little recruiting opportunity here for everybody who's watching this who might not be involved in a technical committee why should they do it Sure. You know, it, it's a, uh, uh, it's a great way to just sort of be involved in your broader professional community. Um, you know, I like having a say and, you know, Hey, let's, uh, let's get together and organize this session at a geo Congress, or let's put on this, uh, 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 this specialty conference, you know, back in, uh, uh, 2019 when we had the, the, the EMI GI, uh, combined specialty conference in, in Pasadena, uh, the four members of the organizing committee, Jose Andrade was the chair. And then, uh, uh, Giuseppe Buscanera and America Santagata and myself were all members of the soil properties and modeling committee. And that was one of the most rewarding professional experiences I've had was, uh, organizing that uh, that conference, um, you meet people that are interested in the same types of things you are. You know, maybe you're on the Deep Foundations Committee or the Shallow Foundations Committee or Embankment Stands and Dams and Slopes or uh, whatever it might be. Um, but but people that are interested in the same types of engineering that you are, but that you might not otherwise right. meet. Right. And so it, it fosters friendships. It fosters collaborations. Um, you know, some of the uh, some of the technical committees uh, develop things like guidance documents. Um, they do reconnaissance after failure, some of them. Um, and there are just so many great ways to, to be involved with the profession um, beyond kind of what you do in your nine to five mm -hmm. job. That is fantastic. Thank you for doing that sales pitch for me. So anybody who follows you on Twitter or knows you more than a little bit will know that you are, unless somebody says otherwise, GI's preeminent foodie. Um, when did that happen? How did you get to that point? Was there one moment or was it a gradual thing? You know, it, it, it was gradual, but then there was kind of a watershed event. You know, I mean, growing up, food was always important in my, you know, in my family, you know, it was, you know, we'd have 
you know, every celebration involved a big meal. I remember uh, my dad had this big jar that that he would put all his change in at the end of every day. And when the jar was full, my brother and I would sit down and, and put it all in coin rolls. And my dad would take it all to the bank and, and get cash for it. And we'd all go out to a nice restaurant for dinner. And, you know, so this was maybe once or twice a year. And, and that was always just a, you know, a real highlight for everyone. Um, when I got to college, I realized that if, and got my own apartment, I realized that if I cooked my own food, Instead of going out to eat all the time, I had more money I could spend on beer. And so, <laughs> and so, so I started cooking kind of in earnest in college. And then when I graduated and couldn't find a, a physics job, whatever that means, I ended up working in, uh, I, I got a, a cooking job in an Italian restaurant in Virginia Beach, working for a woman by the name of Susan Painter. And I mean, she took a risk on me. I, I walked in there cold. I said, I want to cook in your restaurant. She said, uh, have you ever cooked before? I said, you know, no, ma'am. She said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll hire you for three days and then we'll see what happens. And um, so um, I, I worked there for a year, year and a half maybe. And I learned more about food and cooking in that year, year and a half from Susan Painter than in any other year of my sort of culinary life. Um, she was a, a remarkable teacher, an absolute wealth of knowledge, and more than than anything else made me the the, the cook and the eater that uh, that that I am today. And and I've got to plug her that that she owns the the Red Zebra uh, food truck. It's a pizza truck in uh, the D.C. area, and she's at the, uh, the Eastern Market every week. And uh, if you happen to go get a pizza from uh, Susan Painter, her, tell her that uh, tell her I sent you. She's a remarkable, remarkable woman. That is excellent. And hopefully everybody in the D.C. area or those of you when you can travel again and decide to make a pilgrimage to our nation's capital, you can check it out because Eastern Market should be on your list when you visit here. So we'll ask, I guess we have one more serious question and a couple of fun ones. Uh, you mentioned at the top of the show, you've got an administrative role at Oregon State now. How do you feel that it works together with your teaching and research role? Do your hats meld together as one harm, harmoniously, or do they compete with each other, or is it some of both? It's absolutely some of both. I mean, the, 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 the most obvious thing is that time's a finite quantity. And so when you take on additional responsibilities, something else has to give. You you didn't solve um, that with your physics degree? You haven't not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Um and and so so yeah we you know we got, uh, with time as a finite quantity if 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 I'm doing these these uh, you know if I've got this administrative role that leaves less time for you know for teaching or research or or uh, um uh, you know, working with graduate students, whatever it might be. But, you know, at, at the same time, um, it has helped me. So, you know, that just over the last few months, um, it's helped me better budget my time, um, better focus my time and my thoughts. And I feel like I am using time more efficiently to the benefit of, of my students. Um, I have, uh, uh, never in the past been very good at, at, at structure and, and I'm getting, getting better at it now. And, and I also think that, you know, being in this role where, um, we spend so much time thinking and talking about, um, community building, diversity, inclusion, uh, uh, equity rather than equality, um, you know, that changes the way that, that, did I think about other things as well in the way that, that, that I interact with my students. And, you know, I think about, you know, my students from, uh, uh, you know, different backgrounds, different nationalities, different experiences. And, and, and that, you know, we've all got a, uh, we've all got a different story and we all start from a different spot and, and hopefully thinking about that in my, my associate Dean role, it helps me in the way that, that I interact with, students in my classes and and in my research and and makes me better at that part of my job that is fantastic now now we go back to the fun i think we have to i read somewhere at some time that the most influential year musically to every person is the year that they turned 14 I thought that was a bunch of garbage until I thought about it and realized that it was probably true for me. What year in music was the most influential to you? Or was there just a glut of music that you think is great from one particular year? Or have you never pinpointed one year like that? 
you know, the music that I've listened to sort of throughout my, my, you know, in entire, you know, adolescent and adult life is the things that I listened to in, in, in high school and college. And, and I still listen to now, um, growing up in Virginia beach, that was, uh, an awful lot of reggae. And, uh, and then as I, I went to college, I picked up an affinity for the, the grateful dead. Um, I, I still like listening to, to, to old live shows by the dead. Um, you know, it was, unfortunate that i picked him up so late in life because uh i only got to see him live a handful of times before and i'm guessing uh, jerry's Jerry voice passed. was pretty much shot by that it, point it, he sounded different in you know in 1993 than he did in uh 1974 right and uh uh so so you know and, and that's something that 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 i still listen to and and has influenced the other areas of music that that I've embraced since then, because I tend to listen to um, a lot of jam bands in general now. Um, you know, Fish, Mo, Yonder Mountain, Widespread Panic, uh, Twiddle. Um, you know, the, these sorts of uh, you know that's the, this sort of improvisational uh, music is you know that that so much of it has its roots back to the Grateful Dead. So that's probably yeah. the most influential for me. So what are your, this is a bonus question, by the way, <laughs> top three, we'll go with three live, not dead shows, but dead songs that they do live or they did live. Oh, wow. Top three songs. Uh, wow. That's hard. Um, I like not fade away an awful lot. I like, I think that from a dancing standpoint, from just a moving your body, I love Scarlet Begonias. And gosh, it's so hard to pick. Just, uh, you know, I saw the, maybe one of the greatest experiences for me at a show was, uh, at a Warlock show at Hampton Coliseum in 1989, and I saw the first Dark Star in five years, and uh, that that was just sort of a. Uh, uh, I like Dark Star. I don't necessarily love it, but the feeling in that building when the 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 opening notes started will it never leave my memory. And if somebody watching this is thinking Grateful Dead, what's up with that? I will tell you guys, I've been more or less a punk rocker my entire life. I still love the Grateful Dead. There's there's just something about it. You can see how they've impacted all different genres of music. It's incredible. So I think I think for me it's Loser. I love Loser. I don't know why, but that's always been my favorite Dead song. It's uh, got a great little riff in it. So our final question of our 10 today is related to Geo Congress. You mentioned 2012. I think you were probably going before that, and I know you've been going every year since. What is the first thing you try to do every year at Geo Congress? So I'm I'm such a Geo Congress nerd. Um, I always I, I think that I have always been able to make it on sort of you know if we think about the the typical schedule, get there Sunday afternoon for the opening reception and and keynote on sunday night because you know you i get so excited to see these people that maybe i'm only going to see once a year right maybe people from grad friends from graduate school colleagues from other institutions um you know people i'm on committees with these sorts of things i get so excited to see everybody at that opening cocktail reception and then uh i get my swag you know after it's all over i get my swag bag and i go back to the hotel and even if i've downloaded you know we get the geo congress apps now right and even if i've got mm -hmm. the app or whatever I, I go back to my hotel room i open up the program and i get out my pen and my highlighter and i start going through technical sessions and i want to see this talk and i want to go to this session and i want to make sure i see this keynote or this plenary and uh uh it's that uh uh that sense of anticipation on the the, the first night of you know that's the always the first thing i do is i, I try to see all my friends at the at the, the opening reception and then go back to my room and, and map out the rest of my week 
That is excellent. It, it makes it's very rewarding for us to hear that. I think as staff, because that's always I think when our terror is probably at its highest that something's sure. going to go wrong. So <laughs> I'm glad you look forward to it so much. Now we have to ask one more bonus question. Of course, you are at I can never say the name of the state correctly. I make it too long. Oregon State. I know it's Oregon. Um, <laughs> This year, you guys made it to the Elite Eight men's basketball tournament. Mm -hmm. It's been a very long time since the Oregon State basketball team did anything like that. What was it like on campus, especially in this weird year where there aren't a lot of fans at the games or there aren't any at all, and it was mostly people following from afar? How? What was that atmosphere like? You know, it, it's. Uh, uh, I wish I had a good answer for you. I was actually uh, uh, back on the East Coast for for much of the tournament, um, uh, uh, attending to family matters, let's say, and and so I wasn't I wasn't in Corvallis as it was happening. But you know, um, social media is a is a powerful force, right? And there are an awful lot of people that that I follow or that I interact with, um, typically on Twitter, um, that I don't even know. But that uh, they're they're Beaver fans, and and that's why we follow each other. And um, my my feed was just inundated every day, even not on game days. Um, Beaver Nation was just uh, so excited, so enthusiastic, um, and and uh, you know this feeling that everybody's so behind the uh, so much behind the program, and and we've been you know we felt like we're on the precipice for for a long time um wayne tinkle's such a, a a fantastic coach and and to to finally see us get over that hump um it was just uh uh everybody was ecstatic it, it's been a uh it was a it was a great ride um the 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 bracket i filled out I actually had us winning it all um so i was in the lead for a long time <laughs> but alas i didn't win it all that is great, though, and it, I, I think a lot of people in a lot of other parts of the country were rooting for you guys as well. It, it was a very exciting year, and sad to see that Gonzaga couldn't bring it home last night. But I know, I know. I was for pulling for guys. So, Matt, you made it through. Great answers, great interview. This was a lot of fun. For all of our viewers out there, again, if you enjoyed this, and I think you did because you stuck around to this point and you're hearing me say this, click subscribe, get notifications. We'll let you know every single last time we post a video to the YouTube channel, which is frequently. Matt, thank you again for being with us this week. Thanks so much for having me, Brad. It's been a lot. And I had a good time, too. We will see everybody next week.